Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Michael. Oh, hi! Wow, what's what's up, Michael? Um, I was thinking about doing a podcast. Good plan. Okay, we have two movies today. Okay, and I can't really say, you know, voyeurism's easy because I've voyeurism is easy. Every every movie's about voyeurism. Oh, you mean in film? Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, voyeurism by uh, complicated directors. Okay. <laughs> Heavy directors? Can we I'll say take that. that. Is that possible? Famous directors. Thank you. That's the one I wanted. We have uh, Francis Ford Coppola and Alfred Hitchcock today. Yeah, we have The Conversation and Rear Window today. This is one of those double features that comes along every once in a while where we feel like it's actually a good double feature uh-huh. and not an excuse to just talk about two movies right. on the show. Yeah. I feel like we did a, uh, a fine job on the pairing of this one. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people ask me about the show. Oh, hey, you do a show, double feature. What to, what's the idea? How do you pair those? And I try and give them a concept. And the reaction I usually get is, wow, that sounds like a terrible double feature. Why would you ever put those two movies back to back? Yep. That's how that works. Today? Not one of those days. No. A uh, good double feature here. Yeah. These are the surprising days. So speaking of surprises, wow, that was a great transition. You want to keep yourself surprised and not get spoiled. Uh huh. I know you already downloaded the show. You started listening. You thought, hey... I haven't seen the conversation. There's probably nothing that happens in there that could be spoiled. Uh, There is. And Rear Window, too. Yep. Use the chapters and skip over the movies that you haven't seen. One or both, really. We'll make a really, really entertaining outro that you could listen to if you haven't seen either of these films. Sounds like a really good idea. So the Francis Ford Coppola film. I had even forgotten that this this was both written and directed by him. Somebody who's not yet come up on the show, I don't believe, right? No, I, I'm pretty sure we've uh, managed to artfully dodge Coppola. Uh, I, I know when we draft up the schedule, Dementia 13's popped in there a couple times, mm-hmm. and it's narrowly avoided uh, being strung out on the show and beaten to death with uh, overanalysis. But the conversation has not been spared, <laughs> that, uh, that death. And in fact, we'll get, to, we'll get a chance to chat about it today. Can, can I start on something really surface? Sure. Audio equipment. Wow. How fucking cool. That's really the coolest part of the movie for me. You know, I knew you would go negative in one of two ways. You would either mock me or mock the movie via its audio equipment. I didn't mean to mock the movie. It just so happens that it uses a lot of high-tech audio equipment that I thought was really cool. Stuff that I... You spend more time in studios than Uh I do. You are still fronting Glittermouse, the Mm -hmm. band. And you guys record a shit ton. Yeah, we do. Do you see equipment like this in studios still, or is that all gone? No, there's... I mean, it depends on the studio, but a lot of studios like to show off with equipment Ah, like this. Ah, sure. So it's a kitschy kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's there, and then it's usually, look, we have this, and then the subtext of, but I can pretty much just do that digitally now. So show off your expensive uh, antiques, and then show off your skill by stating that with a look... A little bit of a technical wizardry, you can replace all of that old shit. Exactly. The audio equipment in this film was actually a lot of the same equipment used for the Watergate tapes. Uh-huh. Uh, not the physical uh, props in the movie. They didn't you know, borrow them right. from the conversation. But the and same use them models. For, for Watergate. But rather, yeah, the same kind of equipment. And uh, a lot of people, this came out, I mean, right as Watergate was kind of happening. And so a lot of people read into this as a commentary on Nixon. And thankfully, for double feature fans, we don't really need to talk about Nixon at all because it's not a commentary on Nixon. Yeah, that's true. It happened to be coincidental timing, which, I mean, how amazing is that? Do you remember when that bullshit Russian spy movie came out with Angelina Jolie? Um, Roughly. Yeah, you remember this. <laughs> there was also, I know you have not seen the news in about 10 years, but there was a Russian spy at the time. Hmm. So they make this movie, they release the movie, opening weekend, we catch a Russian spy. It's a huge news story. And suddenly people go see this movie that otherwise maybe they would Because it's about have. the Russian spy. It's just what's kind of in uh, popular culture at the time. It's yeah. what people are talking about. They want Blind to see luck more. Blind luck is what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Blind luck. But a fantastic streak of luck. 
And uh, Coppola himself has even kind of said, look, I don't know if anyone would give a shit about this movie had all of this stuff with Watergate not right. happened. His, uh, his terms were a lot more delicate than, sure. than mine were. And it would have been a fucking tragedy had no one seen this film just yeah. because, you know, Watergate wasn't uh, in all Because the Watergate wasn't cool at the time. Right. Watergate wasn't in yet. So they filmed the thing pre-Nixon. It's largely viewed as a Nixon commentary. And, uh, and that's really interesting to me. To talk then about the content of the movie itself instead, there's a lot of stylistic things that are really interesting to me. So we have um, Gene Hackman and mm-hmm. his partner from uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Right. Who, uh, who are both in this film. I was going <laughs> to say who are both back, but I don't think we've ever seen Gene Hackman in anything. Yeah, I, I don't know about that either. He's one of those people who I'm aware he's in a ton of movies, yep. and I have seen him twice. <laughs> Once when he kind of played the same role in Enemy of the State, which is weird. Did you ever see that? You no. remember that movie? It was like a Will Smith kind of thing. I missed Will and, Smith until iRobot. Well, <laughs> he... Uh, you never saw Men in Black? Don't answer that question. This is not the Will Smith podcast. He was this guy, this uh, conspiracy theory kind of XCI. I I saw the movie once when it came out, so okay. I'm really... Yeah, for me, Gene Hackman was always Hoosiers and the Royal Tenenbaums. Okay, yeah, I saw him in the Royal Tenenbaums as well. I'm pretty sure he wore a translucent raincoat in Enemy of the State. Wow. I think it was, it was pretty much the same character huh. from this movie, down to Coppola should probably sue for royalties. The film opens on the shot of uh, what they later refer to as the quad. Uh-huh. I don't know exactly where this is. Right. But we're getting this slow zoom shot. Kind on of, a mime. On, <laughs> right, on a mime, which I think is is probably there to distract us. Right? Yeah, well, the thing is, is from really far away, you see the zoom start mm-hmm. going in. Yeah, right. And immediately I see this mime and go, well, that's the most interesting thing happening right now. We're clearly going to try to find some idiosyncratic, non-interesting point on this quad. But we just kind of zoom into this mime. And this unveils the opening scene, which is uh, really the plot for the rest of the movie. Deconstructing one event that happens to you, you know, immediately first frame of the film. Mm -hmm. And very few movies uh, do that without a sort of gimmick, a flying tom-tom kind of... This is going to be important later. This, right. I mean, this is really the rest of the movie is talking about this one important event. Right. And before you know who any of the characters are or what to look for, you happen to walk by this event. You're getting the, the freshest kind of perspective you possibly can on this. Mm-hmm. They use this mechanic after that of replaying the same scene and pulling out new information. Right. So when you get the scene the first time, you're not actually seeing uh, the scene with the most information you're ever going to right. have. Well, you miss a lot of audio and yeah. you kind of only see parts of it. It cuts to other people right. doing other things. This isn't a matter of just pay attention. All the clues are already there. Uh, you are constantly looking at this from different angles or uh, I guess through different pieces of audio that kind of add, a, you know, add more detail to the story. That really is, are the vital components mm-hmm. uh, that we later come across. But as uh, we're going over and over this scene, and uh, you know they, they change it up a little bit as far as camera angles, and sometimes they'll show the scene out of focus to kind of mirror how the audio is uh, still needs a bit of construction. Right. It makes me sort of wonder, you know, if we can spend this time on what's honestly a pretty mundane scene. Mm-hmm. There's no murder here. There's no exchange of goods. There's, There's no. St- I mean, it's just people talking. There's barely any interesting lines. Right. It's mostly bullshit dialogue. It's mostly filler that the characters are uh, a lot of times throwing out mm-hmm. to throw other people off of what right. they're actually trying right. to discuss. And so it's something that makes me wonder how much we're missing in other scenes. You know, in a typical scene... Uh, something like we'll see in Rear Window, Mm -hmm. where we watch a scene, the scene is over, it's out of our minds, it's completely done. Whereas, you know, that scene from other angles could tell a completely different story. Yeah. You know, there is, uh, there's probably an entire movie to be made over one scene if the conversation isn't already that film. Just by discovering additional details... You know, it says a lot without really saying anything about things like camera placement Mm -hmm. or positioning of the audience, where you choose to place your audience as a director or what you choose to do with your set 
really informs the story just as much as dialogue. Yeah. If you had decided to place that in another location or from another angle, you could get a, a completely different story out of that. Let's go back to Harry, Gene, uh, Gene Hackman's character, uh-huh. for just a second. For a while, I'm watching this and I'm thinking, this is what a private investigator looks like without film noir. Right. right? It's a bit sci-fi and you get the audio equipment and just thinking about mixing to tape uh, yeah. makes me insane. Yeah. I don't even know how people did that without a, a visual representation. Mm-hmm. But it's that same sort of spy stuff. Yeah. That same stuff that makes uh, you know James Bond films exciting. Having these devices laid out in front of you, seeing somebody interact with them. Uh, exploiting a profession that is completely unknown to the right. audience. Yeah, well, it's it's basically showing you a bunch of stuff and you have no idea what it does, and right. then you get to watch it do stuff. Right, and that's the magic of uh, these foreign devices. Yeah. You're sitting there enamored with uh, seeing something for the first time, getting inside a profession that, I mean, uh, probably, let's just go ahead and round and say everybody. Everybody mm-hmm. watching this film has never been, you know, into wiretapping. That's sure. never been their profession. But then, as you pointed out, I mean, our protagonist does play saxophone. We're just doing neo noir, right? Yeah, it really is. You can't get away from. You have a private investigator. Is it possible to not have film noir in some capacity when you have a, a private eye? Yeah, I really. It, I, not it's if hard. the private eye is the main character, and not if there's a mystery that needs unraveling. You're just fighting it so hard. And eventually you give in and you play fucking saxophone. Yep. You have to. So, I mean, outside of his job, which defines a lot of him, how do you describe this character? Who is he? What is, what is he about? He's alone. He's a loner. Yeah. He pushes people away. He doesn't like people to know what he's up to. He's kind of a creep. Mm-hmm. He's also got this really weird religious hang up, which I think is kind of butting heads with the fact that his job requires him to be disconnected. Sure. sure. A bit um, of a, a cognitive dissonance there. Yeah. he uh, He's really well known in the surveillance community. <laughs> sure. He's the number one surveillance guy, which, I, you know, that's like being the best ant squasher, the best pest control guy. Right. If you're not in pest control, you yellow pages. Yeah. Um, But apparently he has friends. He has... Acquaintances, sure. business partners. Yeah. And he has kind of... A, a developed fame that comes with his ability to survey targets and I guess get results. It's a skill set that's certainly to be admired. I mean, part of, you know, looking at him uh, play with these gadgets is attempting to show you this is his craft. This is the work that goes into that. And to kind of help you respect that a little bit from the perspective of someone who has no idea what the fuck he's doing. Mm -hmm. But I think what makes him feel creepy is that he's paranoid like a motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, You know, he has that bit of dialogue with the woman he's sort of seeing or whatever towards Mm -hmm. the beginning of the film. And she's actually being pretty nice to him about how fucking weird he's being. Right, she's she's being remarkably understanding, but kind of in a coy, jabbing, you're a weirdo way. (laughs) Right. Yeah, she is being playful about the fact, oh, you know, it's so weird how you sit up top of the stairs for an hour and watch me as if yep. I'm doing something like, I don't know how she has that much tolerance. It's, it's really pretty amazing. So at first we get this idea, maybe that he's paranoid because of the field he's in, mm-hmm. which ultimately is why he's paranoid, regardless of whether he has cause to be or not. In the beginning of the movie, I kind of feel like he's just paranoid because of his job. Yeah. Do you get that feeling or are you suspicious right away? No, I think I think he knows what people are capable of doing. He's got a very heightened awareness of what people can know you're up to and how sure. easy it is to be under surveillance. You know, sure. how he knows how simple it is to bug your bird. Right. <laughs> and know everything you're saying. Yeah, something they go over at the uh the party at the shop, mm-hmm. which is, that's such a good idea to set a scene. A terrible idea for a party. Maybe yeah. a great idea for a party, though. I, I don't know. know. You bring everybody back to that shop, and this helps us inform the technology, inform the characters, get more of the background, and uh, basically play party gags with all of these gadgets. Mm-hmm. And so in addition to, for the movie to, to kind of set out to convince you that he's you know, good at what he does and that that's to be respected. Right. The movie also kind of has the ambitious task of convincing you he should be paranoid. At the beginning of the movie, it sets itself up saying this guy is paranoid. Maybe he should be, maybe he shouldn't. 
And as you get these details, I think every single detail you get about him makes you a little more paranoid. Yeah. It makes you feel that position he's in. You understand why he feels that way. And it starts to feel more valid as sure. time goes on. The camera work does that too. You get this camera that follows him in his apartment, even early on. It follows him uh, mechanically, uh, sort of like when we did the film Look, that was yeah. all shot from right. surveillance angles. Um, this is the kind of thing that makes us think he should be paranoid. Mm -hmm. You know, when the camera's in a static position and it pans uh, mechanically, really, sure. to follow him, and then he gets up and leaves, the camera just stays there because the camera's on a fucking mount, and then he get, he sits back down. It's one of those things that without really uh, using any kind of writing, any character development, any plot devices, just that camera work helps us feel that paranoia a little bit more. Right. Later, when we get the saxophone playing overhead pan kind mm -hmm. of shot that ends up being the credits, it's both surveying the carnage and almost saying, I told you so. Yeah. It's that same kind of shot that pans back and forth. Sure. Just reminding you, hey, remember when you saw this earlier? Yeah. You didn't think you really should have been that paranoid then. How do you feel now that this man has torn his entire right. apartment and not even found the fucking bug? Yeah. Right? Torn his entire apartment apart, hadn't found the bug. And then between that, we're using a lot of techniques, too, to make his obsession also our obsession as mm -hmm. an audience. You know, that's, uh, that's one of the things about voyeurism in film that's interesting to me is finding ourselves in the position of our characters. Sure. Well, you know, we're watching a movie about people being watched. Right. Well, and the thing that I thought was really strange about the conversation is that you get this intro and you realize that he's kind of onto something and there's something very amiss going mm -hmm. on and he's aware of it. He's trying to get to the bottom of it, but eventually the film gets to the point where even the film is going, just ignore that. Right. Don't worry about that. Have a party, sure. you know, Mess around with friends. Enjoy the convention. Right. Nothing's going on. Don't worry about it. Let it go. Just as his friends are telling yeah, him. Yeah, but right? meantime, you're sitting there going, get everybody out, sit down, figure it out. There's something going on here. Well, just like, and that's another great reason to set this thing up in the shop. You know, he's in the shop with this guy, Bernie. And Bernie's going way out of his way to make sure we know he's second best. Right. And look at all the stuff I've done. And hey, I don't want to say I picked out who's going to be the president or anything. And meanwhile, Harry is still completely obsessed. He can't even really think. He's keeping his, you know, trade secrets secret. Sure. But he doesn't actually really care. His mind is still on this case and what it could mean. And he has to get back to work and he can't let go. And we start repeating, you know, these, uh, we get this, uh, listening to this audio over and over, and it becomes hypnotic, kind of loops in the background, and it puts us in this state where we're, it's just a part of our psyche now. We're just constantly, yeah. it's almost making us feel like the character is going insane. Yeah. He's just hearing this fucking loop over mm -hmm. and over. And as I was watching this for the first time, I was thinking, Am I just feeling like this character is going insane because I'm going a little nuts hearing this, right. this uh, bit of dialogue over sure. and over? And it's another nice sort of pat on the back when you get to the end and find out the character is sort of losing his marbles right. a little bit. He's starting to get some hallucinations. He's losing his grip on reality. I think his obsession's gone too far. Mm -hmm. And that's one of these points where the movie can really be creepy at yeah. times. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, as he's going into this dream sequence... Um, or beginning and, and I guess really the ending too of the dream. The ending is even sure. more kind of shaky. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really very creepy. There's another good moment too. Uh, the one where you liked the composition. It, was it the composition you liked about that shot? Oh or yeah, you, where he was just, he was kind of balled up under the sink with all yeah. of his equipment on the toilet and he was just sitting there listening to the next room. Yeah, it's an interesting shot too because he's under the sink by the uh, the hotel toilet and he he kind of panics when he hears the audio. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he's getting out from under the sink and he's coming towards the camera a bit, we sort of realize that this shot is actually in a mirror, which is normally just sort of a showy thing that a, sure. a movie can do. Or I guess when you look at something maybe like Black Swan, mirrors are used to a huge effect there. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to say it's always a gimmick when you're shooting something through a mirror. What I really like about this shot, though, is he's coming towards this mirror. We, uh, we realize it's a mirror, and then he turns around because he's actually a lot closer to us than we yeah. assume. And we pan up from what's even a more claustrophobic and uncomfortable angle. 
he's just on top of the the camera at this point. Right. And that gives us a little bit more anxiety as an audience. And he fucking darts out of the bathroom and has a panic attack. That, mm-hmm. If I had to pick a moment where I'm pretty sure our character is going, uh, literally going insane, yeah. I think this is probably the moment. Oh, yeah. Well, I would definitely, I would pick both as one of the weirdest, most disturbing things I've seen in a long time. And the moment where he's totally lost his shit is when the toilet starts bleeding. Right, right. That is one of the most eerie, unsettling things I've seen in a long time. You know, you don't expect it. Right. You don't expect it out of a kind of dry 70s Francis Ford Coppola movie. Mm -hmm. And it smacks you fucking hard. Yeah. You know, Coppola started, or at least one of his earlier movies, was Dementia 13. Yeah. That's the the one I was talking about earlier that I keep wanting to sneak in here. And it's really kind of a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Um, As close to a horror movie as anything he's ever done. And I don't want to say necessarily that he strayed from that, but you think about a movie like The Godfather, Mm -hmm. you don't think about that as a horror film. Right. You think about it as a film that has its unsettling moments. Sure. You know, we've uh, talked previously about the boat on the water kind of thing, or I mean, I could name out a a lot of icons from The Godfather Mm -hmm. that are probably spoilers, but things when you think back to that movie, you think about, and they're sort of the offsetting, you know, horror moments. Right. That stuff is extremely effective here because of how out of place it is. Mm-hmm. You don't expect this to turn into chaos yeah. the way it kind of does, whether it's in his head or not. It's just not something you're prepared for. Mm-hmm. Now, one other thing, too, I guess we should talk about. You mentioned uh, religion earlier, the, the Catholicism there. Sure. Uh, what's going on with these religious hangups? Well, I was trying to figure it out. Because I was raised in that persuasion. Sure. And uh, I really think that there are two major things that it points out. One, I think it gives him reason to go against what his job is of just kind of leaving well enough alone. And he thinks... Oh, you mean in, in trying to save this girl, sure. he thinks. And it's it's not that people wouldn't do that. But I think in his profession, you automatically have to go, well, he's the kind of guy that isn't going to get involved. Sure. He's a professional. He's sure. the best at what he does. Right. He shouldn't, you know, he shouldn't be involved. But I think himself. his religious background kind of leads him to try to be defensive in a situation that he thinks he's the only one that can do anything. But also there's this moment right before he, uh, right before the end of the film where he's tearing his apartment into pieces and he takes the statue of Mary and beats it to death and rips it open. And that is this defining moment where you realize that he is officially, his paranoia has taken over all other aspects of his life. He's no longer as hung up on his religious faith as he is on his conviction that there is somebody listening to him. Yeah, ultimately, he tears apart pretty much everything in his apartment sure. until he comes to that piece. And he says, well, it's got to be in the Virgin Mary. Where <laughs> where else would it be? You never really know what kind of surprises you're going to find inside the Virgin Mary anyways. That's true. Okay, so answer me this. Uh, two atheists have this podcast in Chicago called Double Feature. Are you offended at all by the idea that uh, the movie seems to think religion is a requirement for this kind of guilt or this kind of uh, self-sacrifice in order to, you know, find and rescue someone? Or is that just kind of an easy way for the film to show that? I mean, I think it's really just a way for the film to let you know that he has a higher belief outside of his professionalism. Okay. Where, cause that I there's feel, something else to his life. Right. I feel like you have the automatic assumption that a person would do something to help another person that's in danger, which we see in the next film. And I feel like that's canceled out by the fact that he's a professional surveyor, right? He doesn't get involved. That's not his job. Sure. So I think they need another one to tip the scales in the direction of saving the girl. So the movie's not necessarily saying, you know he's got a moral code because he has religion. Right. Uh, just that that's obviously a, a driving force sure. in his life that's at ends with yeah. this other thing yeah, he does. Yeah, and that it, that it takes precedence over his job when it really comes down right, to it. Right, certainly. So what about this ending then? The ending uh, leaves us in a, in a place where we have... Certainly a little bit of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a couple interesting points here as far as Harrison Ford's character. Right. Strangely, I think this is the first time we've ever talked about Harrison Ford on Double Feature. I don't know how that happened, especially with all the fucking Spielberg we've done. (laughs) 
but I don't really know the role. If a, there is a role, there has to be a role that Harrison Ford's character plays in this, sure. right? He's got to be part of the, uh, the grand sort of twist mm-hmm. that happens at the end here. I love that downer note too. Yeah. In addition to being a downer because he's torn his apartment apart, yeah. he also kind of fucked up. Yeah. And uh, that's just that great old, if there's anything that pulls this more towards sci-fi than film noir, it's the fact that we have 70s sci-fi downer, that fucking sucks ending. Yep, you blew it. The other thing I wonder about is Bernie. Yeah. The movie tried so hard to tell us Bernie was something, and then he disappears halfway through the movie. Right. Do you get the feeling that he's involved in this at all? Or is that completely just something to fuck with you earlier? I think it's just supposed to mess with you and create the sense of even the best isn't safe from being checked up on. So then it becomes part of that paranoia, part Mm -hmm. of that, just showing that he has the ability to be monitored himself. Right. And so when that happens in the end, it's not nearly as unexpected uh, because that's not really where the turn is. Right. That's just the ultimatum. And we're just supposed to realize that, oh yeah, that can happen and it'll drive him nuts. I'm going to use score as kind of a transition into talking about Rear Window. But before we do, um, another great thing about, I guess, both of these movies mm-hmm. as voyeuristic films is that they have very, very minimal use of score to give you a greater sense of, I suppose, the ambient environment, right? Yeah. Um, in the case of the conversation, it's a piano score, and it's single piano, and honestly, it's, it's really classy. Yeah. It's it got this sense of, uh, it's fucking lonely and desperate. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, you know, down on your luck. Yeah. Uh, but it's also got a little bit of mystery to it. It has this um, kind of feeling like, I don't know, you're fucking solving a case or something. It's, I always think of film noir and neo-noir stuff going back to the saxophone. Sure. But uh, this movie's entirely driven, uh, really outside of the, the saxophone that the character plays, it's mm-hmm. driven by this single piano. And I think right. it's an awesome choice for the score. Rear Window, on the other hand, I mean, I, I guess we still have piano, but yeah. uh, how's the score from this a little bit different? Uh, there isn't any. Well, I guess that's it. There isn't a real score. Yeah. The score is, I mean, it's a little bit of a cheat they use. Yeah. They basically have the guy who would be doing the score sure. behind the camera. He just lives in the apartment next yeah. door. Well, they, they really compose all the components of the film mm-hmm. in this single scene. Everything that goes on in the film is visible from Jimmy Stewart's window. From right. From this one apartment. Jeffrey's window. And... Anything that takes place outside of the visible spectrum from this rear window is something that is not, I mean, quite literally not in the scope of the film. Yeah, he's armed with binoculars and a telephoto lens. And uh, really, the camera has has very little outside that. It's it's putting us in his perspective, and it's not Mm -hmm. really leaving that. His perspective also happens to keep him in a single room. Which is a, a very Hitchcock thing, and one of yeah. the reasons I like the director is really loving these single-place kind of films. Yeah. Whether it's something like Rope or Dial M for Murder, he tends to have these movies that are, you know, a single set, a single location, yep. really, really focused on what's going on and not so much the eye candy of exploring different environments. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of a twist on that here in that we see a couple different environments, but we see them all from the vantage point right. of a single place. Right. So we know Jimmy Stewart's apartment inside and out. We're there all the fucking time. We know what he looks like in the apartment. Mm -hmm. We know where the entrance and the kitchen is, but we also know these other apartments from one angle. Yeah. And we never really deviate from the flat on single angle of the other apartments. Right. In the few instances where we even deviate from his, you know, his height, yeah. Or uh, an angle directly, you know, directly facing our characters. Yeah. Feels a little weird. Yeah, it's really jarring. And it, it kind of takes you out of this because the whole film is it's I mean, I know it's the theme today, but the whole film has this very voyeuristic feel. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really feel like you're watching a movie. It right. feels like you're looking out a window. You don't realize you're watching a movie until you get an overhead shot of him writing a, a brief note. Right, exactly. And then suddenly it's, uh, how did this crane get inside right. my apartment? I think this is my favorite era of Hitchcock films. 
I hesitate to say that a bit until I've seen every single fucking movie he's ever made. Mm-hmm. He was out of kind of the notorious phase, but far before the birds and psycho and, you know, that sort of stuff that came a bit later. Yeah. We also have sort of the downside of setting this in the 50s in that uh, the film is very much a victim of the 50s speaking on behalf of all women cliches. Yeah, yeah that's Do you definitely... notice these in here? Oh yeah. It's a bit ridiculous, the right? The all women the the rules. It's it's like right. the the woman's handbook. It's the fucking scream franchise for women right. in the 50s. Yeah. So which of these is the most offensive? God, there are so many. There's just a lot. The woman never goes anywhere without her wedding ring. That's just preposterous. <laughs> right. That's kind of annoying. I don't like the fact that all women only have one handbag that they ever use. Is that the implication there? Or is she just saying her favorite handbag? I, uh, I don't know. The movie's trying to give us some handbag advice either sure. way. And I'm not sure if well, I'm I buying think, it. I think it's a device. It's a... It's a generalization to try to justify what could be going on over there. Oh, sure. But the problem that makes it doubly offensive... Is there's a character that goes, oh, you women and your crazy theories. <laughs> right. Stop thinking women believe things. Yeah, it's never bothered me in another film yeah. of the era until I had a character kind of reinforcing the stereotype because it puts a human face on right. what is otherwise just a silly time in film. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it's somewhat of a tie between uh, the intuition thing and the the kind of nagging cliche that's... Mm-hmm really appears all over the fucking place. It's in Jeffrey's conversations with Lisa. Sure. It's in the other apartments. With the uh, newlywed couple. Right. And the guy who just wants to get away and smoke a cigarette just for five minutes. Yeah, and, you know, the thing that makes these difficult for me to just fucking call out and say they're absurd is, you know, leaving your wedding band behind isn't something a lot of people do, male or female, And there's a cliche about the nagging wife, but certainly a lot of people feel that, right? But the nagging wife ends up being motivation for murder. All right, so maybe we're pushing it a little far. I guess I'm just hard-pressed to say, well, husbands don't disagree with their wives. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we don't see the the woman's perspective from that, it's just, oh, this fucking wife always nagging at me. Yep. You know, it's never about an overbearing husband, which is something that totally happened oh, in yeah. the 50s. Oh, yeah. And still even fucking exists today. Or the intuition, right? So women's intuition is one of those things. That is total bullshit. But this one, I mean, I guess this is uh, for me what's probably the worst thing. But it also drives the plot. Yeah. It's also their way to eliminate just a couple pieces where they probably couldn't come up with an otherwise good excuse to mm-hmm. kind of narrow down their clues. And so we default back to woman's intuition. I'm going to give this movie a pass, though, because of Grace Kelly. Okay. So our our two main characters, there's a couple different characters in here. Our two main characters, I'm going to say, are Jimmy Stewart and Grace Kelly. Absolutely. Now, Jeffries, I mean, uh, Jimmy Stewart has a lot of charisma. Sure. And that comes through in this role as much as it does anywhere in Hitchcock mm-hmm. stuff or otherwise. Uh, I can watch entire movies that I know nothing about the director, the era, or care about the subject matter just because I enjoy, you know, watching the actor. I just like being around the guy. Sure. And that was a lot of, uh, a lot of these older, especially before talkies or right Mm -hmm. when talkies started. Yeah. You found actors that you enjoyed their presence. Sure. And they appeared all over the fucking place and people saw their movies. Right. People knew actors uh, more than they did directors. Not that that's not true now, I suppose. Right. This is a a strange role for him, though, because I I guess maybe just in watching this, it's hard for me to hear him fight with Lisa. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it really only happens a little bit in the beginning. But it's, I mean, when he tells her to shut up, it's really awkward. It's, uh, he's a very human being. He has flaws. Sometimes he can get ugly, just as we'll see out of these other people in these other apartments. Mm -hmm. Grace Kelly's character, on the other hand, is fucking incredible. Yeah, now, this could be, you know, she's a model, she's into fashion, she's, you know, she's into right. high society. Right. That's yeah. her thing. Right. And she could be a fucking doormat. Mm-hmm. She could be one of these typical 50s actresses who unfortunately gets a shit part to play, just does her job. Mm-hmm. We talked about a long time ago talking about film noir, how the femme fatale, even though it was a negative cliche for women, right. it was great because it gave them at least something interesting and adventurous. Yeah. Here, Grace Kelly, I mean, she is all the action in this movie. Yeah. She fucking gets to do everything. At the end, 
She is the uh, the entire buildup of the suspense. She gets all the good payoff scenes. I just think she's she's phenomenal in this, and she's used in a way. You know, she gets this role that really didn't exist a lot at the time, or even for decades after that. We were looking. I mean, when we're talking about our show, we probably look to exploitation first as finding a good female sure. role model. Well, yeah, you, Pam Greer jumps yeah, to right, mind. Yeah, right, right. Before you have, there's a thin line of exploiting women and letting women kick ass. Yeah. Before we just got into our female action superstars who are the the modern day equivalent of, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger in mm-hmm. his heyday. And we had nothing like that back then. And this is a really standout role that makes this, among a lot of other things, one of my favorite Hitchcock films. So flaws or not, they're both great people. I guess they just, would you say they have incompatible lifestyles? Is that where we sort of arrive well, at? Well, yeah, I think, that, I think that he, I mean, it's, it's really comes down to the conversation that they have about how he's a go-getter. He goes out, he does dangerous, crazy, um, he does, you know, National Geographic photography right. style things and... She likes to have expensive clothes and sure. doesn't want to get her shoes dirty. But it turns out that he's completely wrong about her. Mm. He just never really paid attention because he was always out doing his own thing. And now that he's trapped where she would otherwise sure. be, sure. the roles are reversed. Yeah, in a similar fashion to uh, you know to the murderer mm-hmm. who is fed up taking care of his yeah. wife. It's, it's that kind of role reversal. In the same way that he's stuck in the house Mm -hmm. and he wants to go out and be adventurous and she ends up being the one in the movie who is, you know, doing all of the adventuring. Right. On the surface, they would seem very compatible. This isn't a, a match of people where you go, well, how do these people ever even find each other? You know, she likes this visual aesthetic of fashion. She's reading these fashion magazines. She's very interested in in that aspect of things Mm -hmm. and she has a great taste for it. And he is a photographer. You would think photographer, fashionista, I mean, these people would get along great. They just happen to, when you really drill down to the specifics, have some what seem like fundamental dis- disagreements that yeah. would make them uh, impossibly at ends. So it's a natural story. It completely works. It's based on something that I'm sure couples run into yeah. all the time. Everybody can probably relate to this in some form or I, another. Yeah, absolutely. And it's totally viable. All of these things are... Well, they're the strong foundation for what would be... I mean, it's no secret that the premise of Rear Window is brilliant. It's a wonderful, great idea to have a murder mystery that's just been witnessed and you really have no way to prove it. And we could do, you know, the kind of thing where that's the heavy strength of the film. Mm -hmm. Or we could do what we talked about when we did Let the Right One In, right? which is have a great foundation then add vampires, or in this case, then add murder. Yeah, that's certainly it. You have the surface hook of things, vampires. The vampires in this movie are murder in your backyard, Mm -hmm. and you are uncovering the pieces from your fucking armchair, right? And then we, we take that and we say, instead, there's this really incredible dynamic between these two characters, this yeah. story about what's happening in their lives right now. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see how the vampires change that or strengthen it really. In this yeah, case, right. it ends up being the clincher to an otherwise doomed relationship. But the surface stuff is uh, really capitalized on too. Mm-hmm. you know, in the beginning of the movie, all of those questions that, uh, that were kind of invited to play just from the movie's title and the movie's premise we talk about that. We talk about it being a uh, a race of peeping toms. We talk about how you know people have changed, how marriage has changed, and we talk about people watching. Yeah, and it's interesting to see that people within the film consider it taboo. Uh, his nurse, especially, makes several cracks at that. But I feel like there is ultimately, uh, and maybe where the movie comes down on this too, I feel like there's nothing wrong with people watching. No, I I mean I I. Honestly, it's one of my favorite pastimes. Mm. And and in a completely, um, I'm not just saying this because it's a wonderful association to the film, but for when I first moved to the city, I spent a great portion of my life just staring out my friend's window because sure. he had a seven story, he lived on a seven story building uh-huh. at the top floor and his window overlooked the Chicago South Loop, which is beautiful 
probably the most interesting place to watch at between yeah. 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. Yeah, if you've never been uh, to the Loop at night, it's it's this amazing thing. You go to the Loop at 5 p.m. and you can barely move. Yep. You become one of those people who thinks the Earth is overpopulated and we're never going to survive. You go to the Loop at eh, 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock. Ghost town. N- not a soul there. And so you see some weird things when, when you start watching uh, yeah, what's well, happening overnight. It, you really start seeing people come out of the woodwork. Yeah, and it's that's, just a, that's really what it is. Where are these people, people coming from? In, in the strangest doing the strangest things and drunks and well who's in the loop at that yeah, time of exactly. night that's the, the, the question the only right? reason you're in the loop is by mistake me that's why you're in the yeah. loop if you're me you are in the loop at two in the morning doing some stupid art thing or taking photos or yeah i've i've come across those people and uh always an adventure every time i completely back you up there i mean you'll remember the first apartment i lived in when sure. i got to chicago was this weird U-shaped hotel building. Mm-hmm. And so my window faced a wall of other people's windows yeah. that were just far enough that it, it really looked a lot like rear window. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't nearly as exciting because we've invented air conditioning and so no one actually left their window open. Although I love that premise that, hey, it's 100 degrees out, so right. everybody's windows are open and everybody can see all their business. So this isn't as much of a mix as, you know, talking about vampires. I mean, you use these things, there's a pretty smooth transition from one to another. Yeah. I don't know if it's as simple as A story, B story, or A story, you know, A mechanic, B mechanic. Mm -hmm. I think voyeurism naturally leads into examining relationships. You know, she's having that conversation with them. Uh, Lisa says people are all the same. They're relatable. You know, they all eat and wear clothes. That's her criteria, (laughs) apparently. Their situation is very similar to their neighbors. Their concerns are uh, something that you could probably compare to, you know, to the people who are lonely, right? Sure. And the fear of being lonely mm-hmm. or the fear of being shut in permanently in your apartment. Yeah. The, the fucking guy playing score who never leaves. The couple who seem to have a great marriage and then their marriage crumbles and the guy can't get away from his wife. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a lot of, you know, Jeffrey's fear about that. I think that possibly simultaneously the strangest and most typical thing that happens at the end of rear window Mm -hmm. is the fact that it becomes almost an action like suspense film. Sure. You have a guy who's confined to a wheelchair, right? Who ends up in a dire suspenseful situation armed with only a couple flash bulbs. Right. And he ends up dangling out a window. This is a character who you forget is mobile. Yeah. Right. Right. And you end up seeing him put in a physical struggle. Sure. And that this, I mean, that's, that's Hitchcock is, is building up the suspense to a point where you are no longer even aware of the same surroundings that you were once totally comfortable with. Yeah. He's in that place. He finds himself in the same position you know, they, uh, they, they mentioned early on, he's talking to his nurse and telling her to, to get back so the guy doesn't, you know, see them. So we're establishing a safe zone. You see him uh, kind of wheel backwards, right? Yeah. And the shadow cover his face, mm-hmm. slowly uh, scale down his body. And that's how you know, all right, you're in shadow. These are the rules. If he's covered by shadow, then nobody can see him. So you know when to feel safe in this apartment and when... It's bright and day or the lights on or whatever, and everybody can see what he's doing. We've established that. Mm -hmm. And so we use those rules to play with suspense a little bit, but we really don't get that Hitchcock, you know, suspense until the end of the movie when we start seeing Lisa sneaking away from the door. I mean, that's even with all the crazy stuff that happens at the end, Mm -hmm. I think that first time Lisa goes over there, for me, that's one of the most suspenseful parts. Oh, yeah. For we're sure. entering enemy territory for the first mm-hmm. time. You know, we're seeing what our characters, our room characters, are entering our secondary environment. Right. They're going over into the danger zone. Right. And we know it's just a matter of time until, you know, that guy comes back from the bar or he hears the letter being dropped under the door. Yeah, something terrible happens. But since we're still from the perspective of being back in that apartment, we don't have to rely on the kind of, say, claustrophobic shots we talked about Mm -hmm. uh, in the conversation. This isn't about getting right up in somebody's face and making them uncomfortable. We're in wide shots the entire time. Yeah. But what we're doing is watching this game of cat and mouse from a perspective you don't often get to see it. 
you know where both the person being chased and the person chasing are Mm -hmm. and where their proximity lies from one another. And it's not a mystery of, am I going to open a door and the guy's going to be there? It's, are they, they don't know where each other is. Right. Are they going to converge at the same point? Are they going to collide? Yeah, exactly. And what's it going to look like? It's basically a car crash at this point and you can't do anything but watch the wreck. And then you have the ending in in Complete Shadow that uh, you mentioned with the flash bulbs. Mm -hmm. When both of their faces are obscured that way by shadow, I think this is, um, just aesthetically uh, at the very least, one of the scarier moments of any of the Hitchcock films. Uh, I know a lot of people go back to The Birds and Psycho, and Mm -hmm. we covered Psycho on the show. And I feel like for whatever reason, that the end moments or the tension moments in this film are even beyond Hitchcock's horror stuff. Mm -hmm. I think when they're both standing there in the dark or when she's racing around that apartment, to me, that's a lot more horrifying than anything he did even when he set out to make what people considered horror films. Yeah, or the birds. (laughs) Or the birds. You really, I mean, you just can't get much more effective than this. Well, we got a website where you can read about these goddamn directors. Hey, excuse me. I believe you uh, promised those chapters that this was going to be a really fun outro. Oh, fuck. All right. I got something for you then. You ready? Oh, yeah. If you go on this website, Mm -hmm. stick with me here. Okay. DoubleFeatureShow.com. DoubleFeatureShow.com. You find yourself a computer. You you open your browser of choice. Okay. You navigate to Mm DoubleFeatureShow.com. Okay. So I've gone to Internet Explorer. No. I'm waiting for it to load. You've gone to Safari or Chrome. Those are the two possibilities. Those are the two Internet Explorer of choice. Those are the only two acceptable browsers. You you go up to the top Mm -hmm. and you click on- The suspense uh, is killing me. You click on not Bad Cat. You don't want to click on Bad Cat. Oh my God. You actually want to click on free Audible trial. Now, Now, hang with me here. Okay. Hang with me. Now- this will allow you to not read, but instead listen to someone else reading a book for free. Wow. You don't even have to pay for it. Okay, I have a question. What if I want to do that twice and sleep? <laughs> you would want doublesleepingnaptime.com. I'm actually working on a whole book thing for our website. Okay. It's going to be great. It's going to allow you to see. This is secret knowledge I'm giving to our listeners oh, right good. now. Nobody knows about this feature yet. Not even me. I'm making it up right now. I'm not. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I want to make a subsection of the site where you can find every fucking movie, and this will ultimately end this stupid conversation. Okay. You can find every movie ever based on a book that we have ever covered. Okay. And then you can see all of the uh, the great movies that were probably based on shitty books. Yeah. And then people will stop saying the book is always better than the movie. Right. That sounds like a fantastic idea. It's great to explore writers, and it's great to explore the authors of books who are otherwise currently uncredited anywhere (laughs) on our website. I left them out because I was like, "Eh, I'll I'll build a book thing somewhere in the future. In the meantime, get a free audiobook because it's kind of like a podcast, and it doesn't cost you any money, and it does give us a couple dollars. Wow, a couple dollars. A couple dollars. All right, so now that you've... uh gotten everybody really excited by talking about books. audiobooks. I yeah. guess I'm going to have to bring everybody down when we talk about what we're doing next week. Oh, God damn it. So it's it's year four, and I get I I guess it's time for another Killapalooza. Holy shit, is it that time already? It is time for Killapalooza, I believe, 13. Oh, something like that. Well, so here's the thing. Last time we had Sleepaway Camp, mm-hmm. that was a damn good Killapalooza. It really was. Now, I mean, I, I, I worried as we were watching this. We've lucked out. We've had at least a good one every year. Uh-huh. Um, in the early year or two, we were doing good ones left and right. Um, now we got year four. Yeah. And we're going to we're gonna have to really work up some good Killapaloozas. Yep. Uh, what have you got for me this time now that we just got off the high of Sleepaway Camp? All right. Three words. I'm excited. Killer... Mm -hmm. santa claus uh wait a second it's called silent night deadly night uh how many of these movies are there there are five of them oh this is gonna be great the first one was banned it was banned because of its ill portrayal of jolly old saint nick oh man this is going to be fantastic what's next easter bunny raping children you know, I'm currently working on that uh, film. I didn't know if you were aware the of The one that about the that. Easter Bunny raping children? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. I am completely stealing and developing that idea right now. 
So you can watch all five of these films, and this is going to be amazing because we're doing an entire franchise about Christmas in Uh September. That's how much we give a shit about Christmas. Watch more fucking film. Bye.